Hey, it's D. It's a brand new episode coming right for you, right on the FTO Network. Enjoy. All right, everybody, this is a brand new episode of Table Cheese. We should find like an intro for this. I'm one of your hosts of Table Cheese. I'm D. I'm Anton. I thought you were going to say the whole thing again. Oh, I'm Anton not sure. of the Cheesy Controller Podcast, <laughs> professional podcaster at your service. There it is. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to get tired of that. I'm not. I love it. You, you put yourself on blast every time. I love it. Uh, mm-hmm. This is episode episode four, right? Yep. It's been a month. Uh, it's been a month. Dude. Oh, my goodness. Happy anniversary. <laughs> Enjoying <laughs> celebrating it in the best way I know how, talking into a microphone about it. Hey, well, I, got, I got an energy drink in my hand, so I'm definitely feeling, feeling all of this. I all got the feels seltzer right now. water. So you... Oh, is that what that is? I thought it was wine. All right. Mm. <laughs> Uh, we don't have any real notes for the show this episode, but there are some things we do want to talk about. Me personally, I want to talk about uh, perks and items you get for beating levels in video games, and why isn't that like the new norm instead of buying loot boxes and whatnot? And uh, I know you got some things from Unity and making the first video game, and uh, whatever pops up in between that, we'll get into it. But um, let's uh, let's start with you, man. Let's talk about like this uh, making a video game. Well, all right. what's, what's, so... what's up with that? Today, I drove all the way out to Decula, Georgia, out in, like, the far reaches of Gwinnett County to go to... So, a few weeks ago, I went to the Georgia Game Developers Association. They had an event with a bunch of small indie devs located in and around Atlanta. And so, I went to that, and they ha- it was about breaking into the games industry. And so, one of the things that they talked about a lot was going to game jams and talking to some of the developers that were there that had participated in game jams, they were working in Unity. And, like, we're always talking about Unreal Engine 5 and, like, the advances that are coming along with that. But Unity is also a huge tool set for game developers, and it seems like the more friendly one. Like, when you think Unity, you think smaller games getting into bigger things because... The latest Atlas game that I've been playing, Soul Hackers 2, the opening splash screen has the Made with Unity, like, banner in it. So, Unity, like, the way I've heard it described is Unreal Engine is, like, starting at the top, and then you can downsize, 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 work in what you know how to work in, but, like, everything's there at the top, where Unity is, like, it's a good starting platform, and then you build up and up and up, and you can, the sky's the limit for as far up as you can go with Unity, whereas it seems like Unreal, you start in the sky, and then (laughs) find your way in, in, like, the little pockets of understanding that, like, and I mean, this is a down to the individual person or up to studio like the studio level like pretty much anybody developing games like if they're not working in a proprietary tool set right now they're working in unreal or unity and georgia just seems to have a big game development community centered around unity and like i i will say like that i guess i'll stop you for a second like the the biggest places for games that i've seen in the u.s is georgia and philadelphia when it comes like to game and developing and gamers also so like i know like uh well, santa few... monica uh santa monica has a lot of developers and then uh, just outside the u.s still in north america canada like yeah. uh montreal, montreal is like a hotbed of game development like can't throw a stone in montreal and not hit uh game studio I'm gonna get a lot of flack for this one. I can feel I can feel the boards on Twitter hitting me like this motherfucker doesn't know nothing about no games. Like, yeah, I'm just I'm just saying, like, you know, from my perspective outside of looking in, like from what I've seen, Philadelphia and Georgia, they're hot when it comes to gaming. But you're right, Montreal, Santa Monica, those are definitely big beds of places for video games. And uh for those of you who don't know, who are like myself, that are not as hardcore in the gaming as Anton is. <clears throat> Unreal has some games that you guys may know about, like uh, Shadow of Conspiracy, Dreamhouse the Game, Dragon Quest VIII, uh, Quantum Error, Hell is Us, and when it comes to the Unity engine, there's games like the Beat Saber, like the, the 3D uh, VR, VR game, yeah, po- and they, Pokemon Go, Cuphead. 
the interesting thing with it is I was working in VR and I like developed a small 3D game today. Uh, nice. But I saw tools for VR development. I saw like packaging stuff for like PlayStation, and it's all just kind of built into like it was a free download. I would I wasn't even on like I was on a laptop at a library that was like the library's laptop, and it was surprisingly easy to get everything up and running. And then no, just no confidentiality. All of a sudden, like no 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 agreements you had to sign about seeing all this stuff there. Oh no! Th- I mean, you like you could go to Unity dot com right now and okay. download Unity and start working. Like this was just kind of like a community class at a wow. library. It wasn't, you know, like deep industry secrets kind of. It was, yeah. I went to a library you- for two hours and sat in a room with some people who knew coding and were familiar with Unity and. Uh, it was me and one other person that were there for the class because it was something super small. So there was essentially three instructors and two students. And oh. But at the end of it, you know, I was able to send my package file to myself through Google Drive. And I'm going to download the Unity stuff and play around with it a little bit more. And like, I'm going to put my, my interview or hat on. I've been interviewing people for a good two or three years now. I'm going to put my interviewer hat and talk to you about this for a second. And I uh, and ask you, like, what what's one of your biggest takeaways from like going to Unity and like and hanging out there? What what what's like, one of, like the most memorable things that like you can think about sharing with us about being there? Well, one of the things um, I've always known that a lot of these game engines have their own asset store, but this was the first time that I was actually able to go in and I actually downloaded some 3D assets that were free from the asset store and just kind of threw them in there. And But I was able to understand for the first time how that process works because we know like Unreal, their asset store is ridiculously amazing. They, yeah. A lot of times they make entire games like Epic themselves and then we'll put it out. Like, uh, the game Paragon, it was a free-to-play competitive MOBA early on in the PS4 generation. And Paragon was kind of like the big game Epic was banking on when Fortnite was just coming out. Now Fortnite pays for everything. Like, the money Epic makes from Fortnite is just so ludicrous like they give developers better revenue splits on their store like Fortnite has got given them they sell their virtual currency at a discount now because they were just making so much money they're like okay we can just like give you v bucks for just cheaper now because we made so much money off v bucks so for me it was interesting like i know the unreal store like so the game Paragon I was talking about, when they shut that game down, they put all the character models, all the animation rigs, all, all the levels, all the everything from that was made for that game just up for free on the Unreal Asset Store. The Matrix Awakens Unreal Engine 5 tech demo, the entire city, all the assets, like the metahumans, which are their like uh 3d models of humans like they call them metahumans because they like are ai assisted and looking real like there are some tech demos uh, out there of unreal engine 5 metahuman tech demos that are just like ridiculously good and so all the work that they did for that tech demo that essentially they partnered with warner uh to make it like a matrix movie tie-in thing uh that massive city, that entire thing is just up for anybody to use. Like, if you wanted to make an open world game, you wouldn't have to start by making the open world. It's just a fully realized 3D city with, like, traffic patterns and just, like, a bunch of stuff. Like, yeah, what I... I'm looking, I'm looking at the gameplay right now on uh, on YouTube. Like, the, the gameplay is massive. Like, the quality is impeccable. Yeah. And it all of like... that's just on the Unreal Store for free. Wow. So, like, if you're developing an Unreal, like, like I said, today I worked in Unity, and there were a couple times where I had to write scripts, and I am terrible at coding. Like, I am not a programmer. That is not my area of expertise. Like, I have a hard time wrapping my mind around it, but uh, 
I was eventually like able to make something that was a working product today. What'd you so, come up with? Hmm? What'd you come up with? Like, what was your, your end result? Well, it, it's, it, so we had to figure out how to program the ground. So I made a big flat green ground and I made an orange cube that was the player character. And I made these blue cubes that had uh, an AI to, if they noticed you, like, they, all the cubes had a front side. If the cubes, the blue cubes, if you passed within their cone of vision, essentially, they would follow you. And if they caught you, I made the UI for a game over screen. And so it was as simple as run away, be the orange square and run away from the blue squares. And I got to play around with uh, the blue squares, like the AI and them would get really confused because I had programmed them not to go over the edge, but I could go over the edge. So I would do interesting things where I would have the orange cube aggro like three blue cubes and then just jump off the edge and see what they did trying to and follow Tom, because they couldn't follow. And Tom became a god today, guys. <laughs> this is crazy. Oh, my goodness. He started creating life. So if I had to explain this to my kids, it's essentially uh, Minecraft for adults is what it's like you were doing. That's, uh, that's pretty cool. I dig it. It's ge- <laughs> uh, What I describe it as is like a twin stick shooter, but just with like the most rudimentary graphics you could possibly <laughs> like. I mean, you said you said Q, so I, I yeah, hear that. Yeah, like uh, actual just. <laughs> orange cube it wasn't but like think about anything like geometry wars or uh super stardust or any games like that it was essentially that because it was from a top-down perspective so like i was building everything in 3d but then i put the camera where it would uh travel above the plane and the camera would follow the block so like you had your area around you you could see and i was kind of just moving the game camera along with the movement of the orange cube on the green plane and then the blue cubes would follow you and so but you wouldn't be able to tell like if there was one all the way on the other side of the arena they'd have to come within a certain distance for you to be able to see them with the way the game camera was placed but you're confident like you you seem like you know you got into it you had some fun like you create like a you could look like a Splatoon kind of type game. That sounds that like fun. I like that. That's nice. Uh, <clears throat> or is it is it like a like a weekly event? Is like is it going to happen again? Are you going back to this place? Uh, well, they they're having a game jam for people already developing. So okay, uh, and that's next month as of recording. So it looks like next month is an hour away from my house. So that's one of the limiting factors about consistently going and working with this group of people but right. one of the, pulling, fuck that. <laughs> yeah but i mean even because i know a few other people who are interested in development and would really enjoy going to something like this because it's not like a really big thing it's just like i said it was five people in a like conference room at a gwinnett county public library it wasn't you know, in the inner sanctum of Epic Games, <laughs> right next to like the actual Tesseract they have or something. It wasn't. So you're telling me I should be hyping this up as much as I am. No, I get you. I hear what you're saying. But it, it was cool. It's not like you still, you still have fun regardless, but it's yeah. not something you want to do every single week. I get that. But yeah. Right on, man. Like, is it is it prompting you like, like to, to keep on making your own type of games? Is that like the next step for Anton 6? Well. Maybe not necessarily. For me, it's a good way to understand, like, the tool Mm. set, like, and when games bug out and weird things happen. The amount of weird bugs I encountered with something as simple as what I made today, in comparison to, like, how complex the games that I actually play on a regular basis are, like, if I was dealing with bugs with essentially, like, three things, like, three elements in play... And these games will have crowds of thousands of on-screen, like, interactable NPC things happening at a time. Like, uh, there's this game, Humanity, that's coming out soon. Uh, There's going to supposedly be a PlayStation exclusive. It's still, like, kind of unclear. Like, we, they announced 
the game at a PlayStation showcase, but then after okay. that, we haven't gotten much information about it. But uh, Humanity is one of those games that it's like it's entirely about the mentality of crowds and like the psychology, like crowd psychology, okay. and while those look like simple like 3D like stick figure esque models having thousands of them all interacting and all having collision and AI and like all the different things that go into just having a character in a game essentially like it's just going to be interesting to see how they play with the toolbox that they have with the game it sounds like like what you're saying, like like your whole experience is it's uh it's making you a little bit more uh humbling when it comes like the talking about and reviewing games in the future. Am I am I gathering that correctly or like you well, get like a, a different perspective on it? I all like I have always had a deep respect for game developers and programmers and coders and developers because that's just not a tool set. Like even when I try, like today the hardest part was the coding part. Like, because I'm not used to coding. Like, as far as understanding how, like, working in, like, the visual end of it, but the actual, when it came time to have your open brackets and your if-then statements in C-sharp, and when all of the, when that stuff starts coming into play, I'm, I will admit, I am lost. I am probably the least knowledgeable person like if i'm having a conversation with someone about development language odds are that they know more about development language than me and so i've always had a respect but now that respect is deepened somewhat i'd say because of now i've never messed around in unity before but today i was actually able to mess around in unity so Mm. i have a little bit more context like uh super sane games from the atlanta area uh making his first person anime mech vr game that looks almost triple a in quality i know that that is an enormous undertaking and he's been working on it for years but he also works in unity and so seeing it's like going from sticks and stones to holding an iphone instantly It's like, what I was working with was, yeah, sticks and stones. I could kind of see how to make a arrowhead or, like, in that example. But I wouldn't know how to go from making rudimentary tools to manufacturing technology, you know? No, I get that. I get that completely. Like, uh, you get, like, a lot of perspective, it it sounds like, from, um, from doing this whole thing. Like, not just one perspective, but, like, many different perspectives. That's interesting. Right. I can think about the amount of games I play, the amount of people I know who... And the amount of games that they play, and the amount of... I don't know that many developers, but every developer that I've met and talked to, like... It's definitely a skill set that is extremely in demand right now. Like, if you can program a game and you are confident in your skills i don't see why you wouldn't be working in development because i could also see it being extremely rewarding like i talked to a guy at the game developers association meeting and uh he was one of the first 200 people in the entire planet to work in unity and he has he's like yeah i've built assets for like madden and like all these different things and he's like i can walk into a GameStop right now and see multiple games just on the shelf that my name is in the credits as a developer and i'm like yeah that that's a flex like that is i mean yeah <laughs> yeah it is definitely it's definitely something like you want to you want to boast and put out there that's uh, that's like that's a hell of an achievement at least i <clears throat> if you want to do more of myself here and stuff like that that's cool there are and but as i was saying also about the gaming areas in in atlanta uh, there's Fugo Studios, there's High Res, there's yeah. uh I've been to uh, High Res and going to High Res was one of those experiences that uh lit a fire under me of I gotta do more. Like I gotta get yeah. myself into an environment like this of 
Like, right now, I work my 9 to 5, and, like, I mean, it pays the bills, but I'm never, like, stimulated by my job. But walking <laughs> ar- just walking around in high res when there were barely any people there, like, it was just desks with computers, with collectibles. Like, you see, I love my collectibles. Yeah. When you th- walk past a cubicle... With just a bunch of like figurines on top of it, and it's like, oh, like ha- I don't even know whose desk this is, but this person's a cool person that I would love to be my coworker. <laughs> <laughs> I dig it. I got a, I have a friend who works for uh for PlayStation. She tells me the same thing that uh, <clears throat> it's always a good time. I got at PlayStation, like she loves her job more than anything else. Like she wouldn't change working at PlayStation for anything, and like I. I really hear people talk about that, but like having someone say that about like working at PlayStation, like I I believe it. And I, like, I, I know I, PlayStation. Well, PlayStation is a really big company. Like High Res makes three games: they make Paladins, they make Smite, and they make Global Agenda. And apparently, not Global Agenda. That was their old game. I don't think Global Agenda is any around anymore. Uh, what is it? Rogue Company. That's their third game. So Paladins, Smite, and Rogue Company are the three ongoing games. And for a developer of that size, where everybody who works for the company is essentially in the building, like PlayStation is a global company, but for even some of these bigger scale developers that are local, yeah, the, like having that kind of pool of just like expertise and, you know, like you're not going to work at a game studio if you're not a gamer. So... Like, just having a job where you have that baseline, like, commonality <laughs> with your coworkers, it just sounds awesome to me. It does. It does sound pretty damn badass. It's not something I want to get involved in. And, like, hearing this out loud makes me think to myself, <clears throat> whenever we get a chance, I think Table Cheese should go to different, like, uh, esports arenas. I know we talked about 404. Uh, yeah. I may have to. I may have to apologize to like the owner of four or four when I get there. But uh, <laughs> definitely four or four or four. I I I called him out like not having enough women inside of his location when he talked about having women inside of his location. But you know that's 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 like an apology I gotta make when I see him to face to face and go from there. But uh, four or four uh, contender esports. I think they have like multiple locations contender. Um, I think there's a uh, silk shot, pulse work, uh, a- a- axr. Well, AXR, I actually had, uh, AXR is formerly Access Replay, and I actually had a job interview with them right before COVID, so... No way. That was, like, I still know some of the people who work at a higher level at AXR, and I know, um, Skillshot is actually associated with high res Like, they're more of, like, an esports broadcasting kind of setup, and Interesting. so... For, and I know talking to you as another podcaster, like when you get into the broadcasting end of things is when I can get really nerdy and technical. And... <laughs> That's the fun stuff right there. Right. Right? You can just, you can talk about like, like like the history being made. I love that. Right. So, yeah, Skillshot, like I'm familiar with quite a few of them of just like going to the okay. Game Developers Association and like. Just networking, because that's one of the things when I get into a room with other people passionate about gaming, it's, even if I go there in a promoting myself in my brand kind of way, like while putting the time and the energy into that part of it is important. At the same time, like I'd much rather have like a high level intelligent conversation with somebody about the value of podcasting and Twitch streaming to game studios because that's one thing Hi Res has understood is Hi Res understands that their players, their communities, their esports contenders, like they are those are the people who are going to be pushing the game the most. Like they do buy advertising on like the side of buses and stuff like that. But they're probably going to get more players from someone like me going to my group of friends and saying, hey, everybody, or my Twitch audience, like me playing a game and somebody in my Twitch audience seeing the game, like me enjoying the game and deciding, hey, maybe that's something I want to check into myself. So, See, now you guys get why I'm talking about all these places on the podcast because of what he just said. So, yeah, like, uh, make sure... Make sure you keep listening to Table Cheese. Uh, we will be hitting up. So I'm going to hit up some of these places. I don't know. If, I don't know if you're going to be tagging along or not. But yeah, I'm going to bring I mean, my computer. 
I mean, it sounds like fun. Just having like a, like a little podcast, watching folks do their thing. Like, I feel like that's a dream come true, man. Yeah. And I mean, every time I've been able to do it, like, and not always does it translate to ending up on like content. Like a lot of times mm-hmm. I'll go somewhere and I'll see something really cool. And like, there's not really an avenue for me to talk about it essentially in any way, like in a product that'll be out on the internet, but just like having that additional perspective, just having those new experiences and having that community kind of feeling like you're part of a community, even when you're just like, you've just been somewhere and seen some people. It's a good feeling. I get that. Like I was going to say, like, like you kind of like touched on what I was about to say. Like, it's like also getting that fire under you being lit a little bit also like you get that that experience you get that fun you get to see like that different avenue that you may not be used to going to different places and like you didn't like you get to see the familiar faces if you do it more often so no right. i hear you i hear you completely like that was the thing uh the guy who taught the uh, the main instructor for the unity class his boss is the one that gave me the information about the class when i was at the game developers association event and he's like oh yeah i remember seeing you at the game developers thing. And that was kind of like, even the people that he was working with, it was like, Oh, well this guy was there. Like he obviously is somebody who is serious about this. So exactly. And like that, that's always a good thing to take with you, no matter what you're doing there. There is, there is something I want to touch on. Like I got two topics I want to bring up. One we talked about a little bit earlier, but I'm going to bring it up, bring it a little later on. But uh, this is something that I didn't talk about you before the show, but I want to see your opinion we talked about this in a previous episode, but um, I really want to get like your your lowdown on this. It's the it's the backbone controller. Okay. I know I know it has like a reputation. Uh, I'm not I'm not sure like how your reputation is on this, but um, it is out. It is for Android and iPhone. Um, the set the base for this is if you're like you can play your game from PlayStation. On your cell phone like through your playstation with this controller so a lot of folks can play whatever games they have on their playstation or games that are specifically made for this backbone controller on their phone and i wanted to ask you do you think this is going to change how folks play video games is it going to like die out in a couple of years is it like not as hyped as like as like maybe some people are making it seem like what are your thoughts on this backbone controller well i was looking to see because i have so the backbone controller itself is just a brand with good marketing for a product that's been around for a while. Like I was looking yeah. for my equivalent <laughs> of a backbone controller, which I'm not going to spend a hundred dollars on a backbone controller, but I did buy a phone, a clip that goes for a DualShock Four. So it's just like too. a PS4 like controller. Bucks on it. Right, and I just clip it around the controller, put my phone in the clamp, and I've played some games like that. And, I mean, ever since Android and iOS, like, Android was better about it sooner, but iOS has added the ability to pair Bluetooth controllers to your phone. Okay. Like, it's kind of opened up, like, because I know for certain people, like, younger kids and, like, even people, like, younger adults are completely fine playing a game entirely on a touch screen like even with like f- digital buttons like uh like swipe your finger to like control like an analog stick kind of thing like for me that kind of gameplay has just never worked it's because like i started off with game boy you know and like having those tactile buttons and like knowing you push a button and an action happens and having that accuracy of you know you're hitting the A button when you tap your finger without looking. <laughs> like No. Yeah, I get that. That like actual like tactile buttons, the immediate feedback, like that is something that is valuable to me. Like my desk is covered in controllers. There's a reason it wasn't easy to just pull out. I just it's controllers everywhere. And so Oh my goodness, you just got a handful over there. My goodness. Yeah. Man. I, a Switch controller, two PlayStation controllers, an Xbox controller. It's another Switch controller over there. Some Joy-Cons. Like, for me, <laughs> having a controller in my hand, like a good it, quality controller, is a good it's feeling. Everything. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's a, no, I get that. It's part of, for me, like, there's a, 
the controller part of cheesy controller is like the controller. controller. Yeah. So for me, that's always something that's important. And like the backbone interests me, not because I would spend that much time necessarily playing stuff on my phone. It's for the times like my PlayStation's in my office and when I'm in my bedroom and I'm just sitting there and I'm scrolling on my phone, you know, I could be doing some random something in some game, you know? So the backbone's appealing for that. Uh, but I mean, in my opinion, if that's the thing standing in the way from you playing games on your phone, like, I have never been one to really think... The, like a lot of people were like what equipment do I need what do I need to invest in to kind of get started with doing this and like the barriers have become so low especially like, lately like there were a lot of artificial walls and barriers and stuff beforehand but like we're in the 21st century 2022 yeah. is like crazy like if there's something you want to do or accomplish like odds are you can uh, at least start on your way to accomplishing it without spending any money, without buying any equipment, without anything. Like podcasting, like that. people like, oh, well, I need to get this crazy mic or I can't start podcasting. No, no. I mean, you got a phone in your hand right now, so. Like, that's all you really need. Like, you, you, don't, even, you don't even need, like, like, you know, you don't even need these. Like, wireless headphones or wired headphones, you don't even need that. Just, like, just use your phone and you're good to go. That's all you really need. Right. Like, we started no microphone. We were using the built-in microphone in a MacBook. Like, we sat around a MacBook outdoors. Like, the audio quality was garbage, but, you know, it was yeah. a start. You build it, they will come. That's all it takes, yeah. Right. And so, for me, Backbone, it's like, yeah, if you have the extra $100 to just buy this and you see yourself, or you're already playing games on your phone and you just know you'd like, like... Uh, a controller to go along with those games because with Apple Arcade, like that was one of the big things. Like Apple Arcade removed a lot of the barriers to like pairing controllers to your phone on iPhone. And that's literally why I bought my controller was for that. And like the, the funny thing is, I bought an XR, the damn thing didn't fit anymore. That's exactly why I got a controller that's similar to the backbone for only app games, app based games, but it doesn't even fit my controller anymore. So no, I hear that. Well, yeah. And so. And that's the thing with the backbone is Apple, like, they're relatively consistent, but, they're like, one year over the other, they'll make their phone, like, a hair thicker to fit one additional component. And then it just, br like, you, <laughs> your cases don't carry forward. So accessories no. that depend on the size and shape of your phone remaining consistent, it's you just can't bank on that. You're done, though. Yeah. No, I hear you. No, you're completely all right. So, like, some of like your final review on the backbone is uh, if you have the money, it's worth having, but it's not like a must have. And uh, right. if you don't have the money, you're not really missing out on anything. So, there you go, right? Yeah, if you have any controller, like I know I would say any controller from the last couple generations, but uh, PlayStation actually was using Bluetooth, uh, with the PS3, PS4, and PS5 controllers, like, they all have Bluetooth receivers but xbox up until midway through the xbox one generation they had like a proprietary radio which was better for more stable connections and right. but it's not good for it connecting to other things but like this xbox i got a xbox series x controller uh one of like the newest ones and this controller is great of just being able to hook up through Bluetooth to my computer, to my Xbox, to my phone, and just have this one controller and do all, all the things with it. That question a while ago on um on Twitter, like what controller should I get for my computer? And everyone said like either Xbox or PlayStation or all Bluetooth. Doesn't matter. DualShock Five. I so my top two controllers right now are the Nintendo Switch Pro controller and the Dual. I called it the DualShock Five, the DualSense controller. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I say probably the Nintendo Switch Pro controller is your best option because the battery life on it's really great, the build qualities on it's really great. Like right. uh, it charges through USB C. Like, so it's give and takes to the best controller to use, but 
I, as long as you make sure the controller has Bluetooth and just, I mean, it's mainly by feel. Like, I've always liked the parallel sticks of PlayStation controllers and, like, my mind, when I think of the button that's up, I think triangle. Some people think Y, Nintendo players think X. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't even understand that. X is at the bottom. Come on. X at the bottom. Everyone knows that. Well, no. <laughs> Not on the Nintendo controller. <laughs> <laughs> weird. So weird. Uh, I, could ne- I could never get used to that. My kid plays Nintendo all the damn time. Like, and I see X. Like, I always hit, like, hit, hit B. So, no, I get it. I, I, I can't get into it. It's too much for me. Uh, I'm an old head, though. So, that's what it is. But uh, we got one more story. I think you, know, like you, get, you may have something after this. But I really want to get into this whole thing. Because I feel like this is, like, this is something that I, like, if this was a thing in gaming, it would get me back into game. If there's like there was more prevalently seen in gaming, I'm I'm telling you, I would get back into gaming just to do stuff, with, just so I can be a part of like an exclusive club, call it what you want to call it. But it, it sounds like like some old like uh, old bro type stuff. But I like it. I think it's cool. It shows like an achievement. Like it's an achievement you can walk around with. Is how right. I see it. But uh, the raid jacket uh, for King's Fall and Destiny Two. There's like this big, this cool bomber jacket. It looks pretty boss. Like I, I got to tell you, like I see like the logo over like the the, the breastplate. It has like a little little design down the sleeve. I think it's 125 bucks to buy, but you have to beat this raid to get this jacket. And right. like I was talking to you about this like before the show. There, there's not many games that do things like this. Like we got like tons of loot crates. We got like tons of passes. I think you guys are like talking about battle passes. I've been hearing about that quite a few times too. Mm-hmm. Like it's something that you can buy in games, especially like shooter games, platform or things like that. But like there's not many things you can buy for achieving such tasks in these games. And like, this is one of the first time I heard about this. Like in my, I'm telling you, man, I was at the gym when I heard this. Who are you guys talking about? Like in my my eyes just lit. I was like, wait, what? Like you can buy a jacket from the game company for beating a certain raid and like only you can get this for beating this raid like you can't cheat the system right by like by being like you have to do this to get this like hell hell yes that's in, like through the icon that pop up on my screen i want like stuff like this and like why do you think like this hasn't caught on like for other other games like is it is it like just not the do fans just not care about stuff like this or like is it is it gonna get bigger like what are your what are your thoughts on this well i mean so it just seems like Destiny was the first game to, so, and I mean, they've done different things where it's like, oh, we have an exclusive in-game emblem, and so the only way to unlock the emblem is to donate to charity and okay. stuff like that. So they've had different things, and I know the they've ha- had a few different jackets. They've had rings. They've had, like, championship, like, wrestling belts. Like, when, huh. if you get world first in some of these raids, because that's the thing, uh, I'd say about once a year we get a new raid in Destiny. And it's always kind of the race to do the world first. And so King's Fall is being handled a little bit differently because it's a raid that was in Destiny 1 and is just tweaked a bit for Destiny 2. So it's not like a new, entirely new thing where people are hopping in and not knowing what to do and just kind of brute forcing their way further in it like it's the king's fall raid is a known quantity i've completed the king's fall raid in destiny one and if i were to go in and do it in destiny two for the most part i remember what to do and so it's just a matter of execution at that point so they've kind of changed the rules a little bit on how they handle it but uh i think the thing about it is Destiny's kind of, well, Bungie are kind of the pioneers of, like, interacting with your game outside of the game. Like, I remember... that last episode, yeah. They they were the first ones to really have, like, your online stat tracking. Like, you used to be able to go through Halo Waypoint and... Or it was something before it was called Waypoint, but uh, you were able to go to, well, Bungie.net. It's still Bungie.net, like, after all this time, uh, where... You were able to look at your kill-death ratio, like the where you died on the multiplayer map you were playing on last time you played. Like They had these things that kind of connected to the outside world from within the game, and 
so they were kind of like early on with doing that and i mean they have a merch store where you can buy like cyberpunk the jacket from cyberpunk that's that really dope bomber jacket that was something that was just for sale to the general public and the way that they do it right now with destiny is they'll put an item on their shop like the jacket but they'll charge a billion dollars if you don't have a discount code like literally (laughs) a billion dollars (laughs) because <laughs> nobody's funny. gonna spend that billion dollars to get that jacket but and then when you beat the co- the raid or do certain things within game because like the jacket is one thing but like your player emblem affects a lot in the game it affects like your player card it affects the way your menus look in a certain way so like emblems in destiny are something that like, there are some that are as easy as go to this planet for the first time, but then there are ones that are like, oh, beat the raid on the hardest difficulty or stuff like that. Or they, So, if you look into the kind of emblem chase with Destiny, that's one of the things that they'll definitely always do a lot of creative things with. Because, like, I get emails, they're like, oh, well, you set up cross save. Uh, with Destiny 2. So within Destiny, they know that my Bungie.net account, that has been the same Bungie.net account that I've been using since the Halo Reach days, that, like when Destiny started, I got something for being a player of Halo. When Destiny 2 first boots up, I don't know if it does this anymore, but like when Destiny 2 was a box game that you had to pay $60 for, when I got Destiny 2 home... And the servers went live and I started playing the game. It remembered what I did in Destiny 1. It showed me the raids I had completed in Destiny 1. And the date and the time I completed them. And the fire team that I had with me. And it was like, at this point, this had been years ago. Like, it was probably four years between Destiny and Destiny 2. And the first one I played within the first year of Destiny. And I was like, I don't even know where some of these people are, but I definitely remember finishing this raid with these people. And so that's, and that's one of the good things. Like I know people get annoyed a lot when you have to make an, like you buy a game, you bring it home, you put it in your console, you start it up and they're like, Hey, either log into your Rockstar, Bethesda, like the amount of different <laughs> lo- logins, they, like Square Enix, like pretty yeah. much every big publisher has like, that up. a login. Ready, a lot of folks talked about that when the first Kingdom Hearts came out and the second one came out and like they, they wanted to transfer all their old information to the new game and you couldn't do that. So no, I, right. I remember that. And so the best way for that to happen right now and like now with cross gen, because like GTA, if you bought GTA Five day one on PS3, because of the Rockstar Social Club, you could export that character from PS3, bring them to PS4, export that character from PS4, bring them to PS5. And certain games are even better about it than like how Rockstar does it, where you don't have to stay in the same console family. You just like. And, I mean, that's how Destiny's cross-save works right now. My Destiny character that I've been leveling and playing on PlayStation, if I were to go in my bedroom, turn on the Xbox, and open up Destiny, those exact characters, the exact guns, the exact everything, are just over on my Xbox save. That's insane. I'm looking at it right now. Like They call it migrate. Like, uh, I didn't know, like, you can... I didn't know you can do that with GTA characters. You can just migrate characters over it. Yeah, and so, like, people always complain, and, like, I get that it's kind of an annoying thing of having another username and password to deal with, just like we, everybody on everything has a million usernames, a million passwords, like, you get tired of having accounts, like, sometimes there'll be something online, and they're like, oh, set up an account, and I'm like, nope, I'm not doing whatever, it was. it's not that serious, <laughs> I'm not going to be here that long. Stop bugging me. No, I get it. (laughs) Right. So, but I mean, Bungie were some of the pioneers of this, having Bungie.net and linking it to whatever account you're using and then being able to read that information outside of just that account on wherever you started it. I see see where you're going with this. It seems like... uh... Like not many people do this, and Bungie, like you know, does it. But it seems like they're they're some of the only few that do it. I, I was right. looking it up 
as you were talking about it, like there aren't many people who really do trackers. I see that Fortnite has some tracking, but not oh, as well, prominent. And that's one of the things with Fortnite and because Fortnite did cross play and cross progression before okay. Destiny. Okay. Because okay. they started doing the networking work on the like engine end of Unreal Engine and they accidentally like this is a great story that i always love like um early on there were a lot of games pushing for crossplay because if you have all your players in one big pool it's easier to get players for activities than if you like if you were playing on i'll use stadia as an example because it's one of the most random things that just kind of fits into this equation i played destiny on playstation i've played destiny on playstation since i started playing destiny if you came into the game new were playing on stadia or really hardcore and you're like hey i know you were talking about playing destiny you want to play together sometime but in the olden days i would have to either get you to start over on playstation or you'd have to get me to start over on stadia yeah and so okay, epic yeah. one day accidentally like a bunch of companies were pushing for crossplay because like fortnite was the first one to my knowledge well there are a couple weird examples like final fantasy 14 is cross progression but like that's handled by your square enix account so you log into your square enix account on playstation and it has all your game time your character everything like that and you can play on playstation same deal when you go, like, I know there's a Steam version of Final Fantasy, but there's also just the PC, like, core version of Final Fantasy. And so, if I were to get a Steam Deck and I wanted to play Final Fantasy XIV, I, I can play it confidently knowing I'm not starting over. I don't have to put the thousands of hours I've put into that game, into the exact same game, just on a different platform. So, so that's... that's... It sounds like 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 demand for it isn't there. Like if I can break down what you're saying to me about like this jacket and like the crossplay and like the the merch and the train like the the tracker and all that, it seems like like some places have it. There just isn't a high demand for it, like on all platforms when it comes like the different types of games. And like I feel like <laughs> I I know I said this earlier, but I would I would get a game, get Destiny two, beat that raid just about this jacket, so I would constantly talk about it because I have it and I see no one else talking about it. I'm going to make a TikTok video about this once we get off of this, just just to let you know, because I want this jacket, like, period. Well, period. yeah, I mean, I look forward to seeing it. Hopefully it, uh, you post it over on Instagram or Twitter, because <laughs> I've legit opened TikTok on my phone probably three times ever. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. I'll keep that in mind. Not, not a fan of TikTok, huh? Well, for me, it's just kind of like... I, I'm i not the biggest fan of consuming social media. Like, I understand social media's place in, like, putting information out there, giving your hot take on whatever. Like, like I'm more of a poster to social media than a consumer. And, like, TikTok is very much aimed at consuming. And I had my phase where I did Vine. And, like, like my two primary things are putting up random stuff on my Instagram story and watching people's Instagram stories. I don't even scroll that far on Instagram anymore because it's just so inundated with ads and just like people you don't follow or know or anything. And it's just like, this person's just on my timeline. So that's great. Like that, just, that's there. Yeah. Right. Thanks Facebook. I mean, Instagram, like, <laughs> right. And TikTok is a lot of the similar problems I have with just being, like, when I was younger, I was a consumer. Like, I'd spend a lot of time on Tumblr. I'd really, like, do those things. Like, I had a lot of fun with Vine when Vine was a thing. But, I mean, now I'm an adult with limited time and limited effort, limited attention. And TikTok's wait, just wait. one of those things. Like, I'll see if there's a TikTok that's just really, really good, I'll see it somewhere else. Like, all you, the you, you. really biggest TikToks, I either, like, somebody will post them in the Discord, or I'll see them on my timeline on Twitter, or someone will put that. it in their Instagram story on Instagram. Like, but for me, going to TikTok, 
there's nothing like I'll go to YouTube to like because I can <laughs> YouTube has a search function so I can find the stuff that I'm looking to watch, but just hope leaving my fate up to the algorithm, like that's time I got to kind of invest into. We gotta talk about that next episode. We gotta talk about like like the difference between TikTok and YouTube. We got we got we got we got to talk about right. that and for the, sure. The crazy thing is, in YouTube's opinion, TikTok is their biggest competition. TikTok and Snapchat. <laughs> Are there I, are the competition to YouTube in YouTube's opinion? Snapchat's for porn, whatever. I'm caring about this. Snapchat is for seeing adult content. That's what, what? Snapchat is for. And so if it, if that's the only reason why it's a competition to anybody, but uh, I get like like the the feed they have on Snapchat, but like Snapchat is going to be dying out soon. I I wholeheartedly believe. I'm that. surprised but, uh, when Snapchat did. I remember there was like a year where they just shot themselves in the foot. Over numbers, and over, yeah. they were like, they on their like featured page had the thing. Who was wrong, Chris Brown or Rihanna? And it like they lost a lot of followers with that. Yeah, yeah. And I, I just like I used to be on Snapchat. Like I'd use my Snapchat story. I just post random stuff. Like see other people's Snapchat stories. But and I, I mean to this day, I know people who still use Snapchat, and I Ditto. continuously ask them of why. Like it, to me, it's a dead platform. Like, yeah, it's like using MySpace. Like, that's how I see it. I uh, I think Kendall Kendall Jenner was the person like who really like, like cemented it for me when uh, she said like I'm deleting my Snapchat account because it's boring to me. And like after that, like I like well, they lost like a lot of investors after that happened. And uh, I don't think they recovered since. I think they're trying to, but I don't think it's gonna happen for them. Uh, if uh, between you and me, I feel like they are focusing more on like putting mostly like a certain type of people on a platform and not being more well-rounded of other content creators. So I think like that's well, their, the weird that's their thing biggest... about Snapchat is Snapchat, in my opinion, is more like translatable to texting somebody. Yeah. It's just like, but it's using a third party app, which like I get other countries where WhatsApp's like prevalent and stuff, but like here in the States, like why would you need that? Right. We have iMessage and we have text messaging. Like uh, And like if like if it wasn't that we have we have Instagram. Well a lot of us use Instagram for yeah. things like that. So why would That's why would thing. you need Instagram that? stole the stories thing from Snapchat and just completely <laughs> they decimated. ran with it, dude. Right. They ran with it. Like so wait, so wait, you tell me I can look at my friends' pictures and I can look at their stories in the same place? Like, yeah. Right. I'm gonna tell Snapchat the F off. So then that's what happened. So Yeah. Huh. Uh that's all I have for this week of table cheese. Uh, I swear to you guys, next week we're gonna get much more, more interesting topics. We we're still trying to figure out how we're gonna like plan out all this stuff. But so far it's been fun. Yeah. Like listening to you talk about Unity, that was a that was a good time hearing about that, man. And um I gotta find a way to make these bomber jackets cool, dude. I want to make sure, like, 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 pay to play is this. I want this to be pay for play, like, you know, pay to play to get like cool merch from companies. Cause that's, I may well, be old. I mean, that could be it. They just kind of take the barrier of being, cause there is an edition of Elden Ring that is just amazing. It has a full size replica of the helmet, a real legitimate sword. Like a statue of Melania, the hardest enemy. Well, arguably the hardest enemy. The hardest enemy for me in the entire game. Uh, and they only sent it out to content creators. But something like that. Like, I would pay money to get an Elden Ring sword. See, that's the problem. Like, I don't I don't need, like, content creators, like, to have these merch, man. Like, cool. I mean, like, it's cool to see them talk about it. I like, can give them, like, a, a display with their cool lights and awesome cameras but like i want that kind of stuff man right and like i think just bungie's the only one that blurred that line of like they because like all these things like there's a playstation gear store which has really cool like officially licensed playstation merch right. and that's one thing and like people have been getting better about that like i remember for a long time getting a shirt with a video game character on it was like a task. Top. Like it was top. Yeah. 
<laughs> like you would have to put in legitimate effort for that. But and so it's gotten a lot better. And like figurines, things like amiibos. Like I remember for a long yeah. time the figurine market. And I mean, there are still expensive figures out there that if you want to spend money on that, like you can do that. But I remember everyone their uncle wanted a damn amiibos. I remember that like oh, vividly. Yeah. I yeah. completed. I had the entire Smash Bros. run. You don't say. Smash you don't. You, you don't say. I never would have guessed that, Anton. <laughs> never. <laughs> and the the funny thing is, the majority of my amiibos, like I probably have like twenty amiibos on that shelf back there. But outside of that, like I had easily over a hundred amiibos. And I can so. honestly see that. No, no, no insult, no shame, mind you. But like that does not surprise me. In the slightest. <laughs> right. So, yeah, props to Bungie for not just having a merch shop, not just giving stuff to whatever quote unquote influencer you want promoting your product, like having a way for a normal everyday Joe to get into your game and reward them for getting into your game. I'm going to make it a thing. I, I'm telling you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rip that video from YouTube, like the, the King's Raid. I'm gonna I'm gonna show this awesome jacket and I'm gonna, make, I'm gonna put it on my TikTok for our post everywhere else and I'm gonna make it a thing. I'm gonna have people talking about it because it doesn't have a name. There's no name attached. It's not what I can see. Like, is it is it a urn to play? Well, what do they call this? Like like these uh, these raid jackets, these uh, these raid items. It's just like physical rewards. Like games have been always really good about giving you digital rewards. And Bungie said, hey, what's cooler than an in-game emblem like a physical pin? You know physical reward digital reward i don't know i'll figure something out i get i get, I'll, I'll get my thesaurus and find something else that's a little bit more cohesive <laughs> yeah i mean coin the term like <laughs> that's it. part of the road of progress that we need to be on to get this more widely adopted because free to play wasn't free to play until like some of the big early free to play games came out and started calling themselves that and yeah and that's like games as a service like games as a service wasn't a term in the gamer lexicon a few years ago but now games is like when i say games as a service if you were a gamer you know exactly what i mean and so and like they all they want is my money anyway like this is like I, I feel better off giving them money for things that i can wear and show off that like i did x y and z than just buying 20 more bucks of a 60 dollar game i already paid for like that's no that's ridiculous to me i'm not doing that yeah so there we go I think that's I think that's the show. Anything else you want to talk about? Uh no, I think that's good for this week, you know. Well, I promise like for everybody listening <laughs> that just thinks I'm like this Destiny evangelist, like Destiny's not the only game I play, Monster Hunter's not the only game I play. Oh, I was gonna call you out too. I was gonna Final like, no, Fantasy's it's not the only game I play. Like I was so going to call you out on that. Like, no, but, it's Monster Hunter. That's the game he plays all the time. Yeah. By the time we record again, Splatoon 3 will be out. And I, I love me some Splatoon. So you can you can hyped about that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, make sure you listen to the latest episode of Cheesy Controller because he goes on and on about Splatoon. Him and, him and his buddies on Cheesy Controller go on and on about that new game coming out. So, yeah. Because yeah. Splatoon 2, like, Splatoon 2 is one of those games I threw it in my Switch the other day. Uh, but I'm excited. I'm getting this one digitally, so it'll just be on my system at all times. I have my Split option. Pad Pro, so yeah, I'm and ready to go. Next month, now I got two months from now, November, and then you know that that's when like the the big baddie come out, and everyone's gonna be on their on their consoles. No one's going outside. No one's gonna be talking about football. It's gonna be just God of War Ragnarok. That's, yep, that's, it. that's the beginning of November, and then the end of November is uh, Call of Duty. Yeah, that's it. That's the one. I'm not a big Call of Duty fan, but I know everyone else who plays games. Even non-shooters love this same game for some reason. It's a zombie feature. I swear it's a zombie feature. Well, the interesting thing about this Call of Duty is... Uh, it's called Modern Warfare 2. They rebooted the Modern Warfare franchise a few years back, and that, in my opinion, is one of the best modern Call of Duty games. I, I like seen it in action. It looks gorgeous. Like it yeah. seems fluid. It seems a lot more stable than like the other Call of Warfare games. Like I hear you completely. And so this year they're doing the Modern Warfare reboot, but it's Modern Warfare 2. And so Modern Warfare 2 is my second favorite Call of Duty game, period. 
Like I my my favorite is Black Ops. If they were to remake the original Black Ops, like I'd be over the moon. But you know, Modern Warfare Two is a strong second, and to be getting a new Modern Warfare Two in 2022, ten years after the original Modern Warfare Two, yeah. like I'm still that's why I can see it. Like I'm pretty sure like that was like that was like in a height of like your your gaming uh you know progression like when more Modern Warfare Two came out. Like I know like all the all the high kid high school kids and like in college kids were talking about Modern Warfare Two. That was like on everyone's lips. That was uh that was the Fortnite of his time, Modern Warfare Two. Right. So yeah. It was not pre internet, but it was like pre live service games. Games and yeah. service like, it was it was the it game. It was a it game for sure. Like even I had to get like a uh, I got a PlayStation three and I got an Xbox One when I when I well, three sixty three Xbox three sixty when I came out. Like I had to I got it just so I can get that game just so I can play with everybody else because no one everyone I knew would not stop talking about that game. So I had to go out and buy. I bought it for both consoles too, which is never do that. Crap. Do I have <laughs> Modern Warfare two? Might be one of the few games. That I have a PS3 and a Xbox 360 copy of. Because <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, dude. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, like, now I will buy games. On, like, a few years ago for Black Ops 4, I bought the Xbox One and the PlayStation 4 version. Because crossplay wasn't a common thing. And so, like, I'd get on Xbox and play with my Xbox friends. And get on PlayStation and play with my PlayStation friends. So, like, Black Ops 4, I bought two copies of. But when I was in high school, I started off and I just had a PS3. And so I got all these games and like built up my collection of of PS3 games. But then when I started getting summer jobs and stuff like that, and I bought an Xbox 360 and that kind of became my primary console, I would buy certain things again because like hopping in and playing a match of Modern Warfare 2 felt good no matter what. So I would get another copy of the game for xbox 360 just because that was the console i was on primarily there you go thanks for going down memory lane with us we are we are definitely some old heads i think i think we got some we got some lineage when it comes to our gaming gaming life for sure uh i'm d of f200 talk make sure you follow f200 talk follow me on uh follow this podcast they have more hear myself on table, table cheese and all the that are FTO podcast. Anton, where, where can people find you? People can find me around the internet, cheesycontrollerpodcast.com. You can follow me specifically on Twitter at anton 6 3 xs uh, Instagram is Anton, the number six of two X's, because I see a lot of your audiences on Instagram. So if you guys want to find me over there, I don't post often. Uh, you can follow me and see my story. But even that is sporadic like. He's getting more into it. I've been noticing. He's been posting more pictures of himself and whatnot in there. Yeah. So, you know, it, it may change. He yeah, may Twitter, be getting to the social like, media world. If you just want hot takes and, like, actual activity and, like, comments on public discourse and whatever, Twitter is the best place to find me. Twitter.com <laughs> slash Anton6 for your quick fix. <laughs> I like it. I like it. You're a cool dude, Anton. You're always cool. Uh, this is it. That's the show. Until next time, you guys... Take it easy. Keep it cheesy. Hey guys, D here of FTL Nerd Talk. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Make sure you like, subscribe, follow, tell your friends about FTL Nerd Talk. Got a lot of different shows for all of you. Make sure you tune in every week for a brand new episode. Take it easy.